<laughs> I, I, um, I really love this seat. <laughs> I really love it. Um, because I get to see you all at once. And you're so beautiful. It's amazing. We don't get a lot of opportunities to look into the eyes of so many people at one time. I hear so often, oh, can you hear me okay? Guy, is that good? Much better? Okay. I said that you're beautiful. <laughs> good. <laughs> so um, I hear we, we all talk about how beautiful it is outside, right? The view is so beautiful outside. The weather is so lovely outside, but it's beautiful inside. I really love this view and I love this seat for that reason. It's a little funny to me that I would say that because um, most of you don't know that before I came here, years before I came here, I had terrible stage fright terrible. I couldn't even um, answer a question or in a group. It was really bad. <laughs> so sometimes when I'm about to give a Dharma talk or I'm sitting in a, in a group, that memory comes up for me. I'm reminded. And then I, I tell myself, I remind myself that I have two choices. So my first choice today is that I can come here and I can really try to give a good talk. I can try to give a talk that you're gonna like and that you're gonna approve of, that you're gonna approve of me, that you're gonna think that, or I'm gonna make you believe that I know something about this practice that I love. I can do that. Um, but then I create separation between us. And that talk, this talk, becomes about self, becomes about um, fear. And it doesn't matter what my intention was when I came here. It makes no difference. It's all about me. The other choice I have is um, to surrender, to open my heart to the moment as it is, to risk being vulnerable. to have sincerity. And in that way, you may or may not like what I have to say, and you may or may not approve. That's okay. It's not because I'm not coming here to talk at you. I'm not coming here to teach you anything. This becomes more than a talk. It becomes an opportunity for us to have deep listening practice. If we can be vulnerable and surrender to the moment as it is. And it turns from self-protective teaching to an opportunity for awareness. Even if we, let's just take, if you take 10 seconds right now, we can feel the difference in that. If you just take 10 seconds, don't close your eyes. Look around you. Just take in what is here, the beauty that's here. The moment of stillness. Limitless light, limitless life. Be still and know that I am God. Okay. So this is living prayer. I think of it as living prayer. And living prayer is, is felt when in that which arises as a natural state of openness and gratitude. That's prayer. So in the, in the Psalms, in the Bible, it's called Selah. It's an, uh, it's an 
untranslatable word because it means also, it means stillness in this moment, but it also means to uplift. So it's a little bit difficult to translate. Um, also, uh, shamatha in, in a Buddhist terminology or samatha in Pali. In one Buddhism, we just call it pause. We pause and we return to our true nature, pause. But how do we pause in our daily life? It's a little easier in Dharma Hall, at least for me. So of course we practice, right? We practice, we, we're here to practice. We utilize the threefold study, our threefold study. We utilize uh, cultivating the spirit, right? We, we do our meditation practices and our chanting practices to gain one-pointed concentration. We, we inquire into human affairs. We, we try to gain wisdom about the world, universal principles. And then we make, try to make wise choice and action. So we do that. We're here to do that. But I want to look a little bit closer at um, the practice, the scripture. So Reverend Yu often says that um, we need a map to find our way. It's not enough to know our destination, that we need the teacher. We need a GPS, he says. <laughs> he often says we need a GPS, we need a map. We need the Dharma. We need our teachers to point the way, to show us the direction. It's true. I thought about this a lot this week. And I thought, we also need to know the rules of the road, right? We need to know when the light is yellow, we should slow down. When the light is red, we should stop. When we have to turn, we need to know, we need to turn on a blinker and turn, make our intentions known that we're going to turn. So Master Sodasan gives us this. This is really miraculous to me. It's miraculous. He gives us he gives us a view of what we will encounter as humans. He provides us with perfectly precise guidance of the now. So to put it another way, um, he shows us a template for every interaction we will ever have as a human in the nine essentials of daily practice. So this is a condensed version of our practice. And most of us, or most of us are familiar with the nine essentials because we say them, we're going to say them today. We say them every Sunday and we study them, some of us, in Reverend Park's class on Saturday morning. But today I want to look a little bit closer at the first three of the nine essentials. The first three begin, the mind is originally free. The mind is originally free from disturbance, delusion, and wrongdoing. But disturbances, delusions, and wrongdoing arise in response to sensory conditions. So let us restore equanimity, wisdom, and the precepts of our true nature by letting go of disturbances, delusions, and wrongdoings. Wrongdoings meaning like moral, moral conduct, restore our moral conduct. So what do you think he's saying here? So I want to share with you, with you what I hear when I read these words. You know, I always feel like the scripture's alive and it's talking to me when I read it. So I think to me he's saying we get this gift of this human life. We get to experience human as a f this form of consciousness. And we get to experience the world through our senses. Just don't sleepwalk through it. That's what I hear. So I'm going to share a small moment just to explain what I mean when I say that. And I, I'm going to share a small moment from my life. I could pick. There's a million that we can choose from. <clears throat> but 
I'm sharing a simple moment because I feel like that's the real struggle, right? In our daily lives, it's a real struggle. Just our interactions to be in the present moment, to be aware, to be awake, to pause, to surrender. So these are the experiences in our daily life that we encounter that keep us in habitual patterns of dissatisfaction. We suffer because we want to be somewhere else. We want to be doing somewhere else. Suffering is not satisfied with the moment as it is. Not in a state of acceptance with the arising mind, the arising feelings as they are. It's where things become easy to complain about, right? The alarm, the traffic, the boss, the bills, the spouse. I think I'm guilty of all those. <clears throat> so, so I'm going to, um, I'm going to share a moment, silly, but it's my one moment. It's about my dog humble. I have this dog humble and he's a boxer and, um, he has a best friend and his friend lives down the road and his friend is a golden retriever named Ike. So I have no idea how dogs do this, but he can sense when his friend's coming down the road, right? So what he does is he runs full speed at the glass door, <laughs> runs full speed. So this is not bad because he's pretty amazing. So he runs full speed at the glass door and he jumps up and he takes his hand or paw or whatever, and he pulls the door down and he lets himself out. So don't tell my husband, but I don't stop him because I think it's pretty amazing that he does this. So anyway, when he does this, he releases the mechanism at the bottom of the door and the door that used to close really nicely now slams. So, so one, a few years ago, I was coming home from retreat. So peaceful. You all know what retreat's like. You go home, you kind of float through your front door. Well, I did. I floated through my front door and I stood just a second too long and the door whew, hit me right in the, in the, <laughs> hit me right in the back. So my lovely, peaceful mind in one second went to anger. Just like that. A rising mind in response to sensory conditions. <clears throat> so I actually looked over my shoulder and went like, you ever do this to an inanimate object? You're like, hey, like, hey, buddy, you, <laughs> you hit me. So a little bit silly, but it's true. <clears throat> but because we experience the world through our senses, this is what happens. I didn't expect the door to hit me. So anger arose. And this is just a human moment as it is, right? It's not. And Reverend Park would say, where is Reverend Park? Reverend Park would say, is anger good or bad? Reverend Kim would say, anger is just anger. It's just anger practice, right? So it has no intrinsic self-nature. It's dependent upon us. It's dependent upon our perception for its existence, dependent upon our grasping, on our judgment, on our discrimination. <clears throat> At that time, I wasn't able to catch my mind, my mind's response before anger arose in me. But when I realized how ridiculous I looked, kind of being mad at the door, that it made me laugh. So I was able to come back to my original mind come back, restore my equanimity, and come back, return to. In other words, I was able to pause. So this is the difference between waking to the moment or sleepwalking through it. Because I could have held the anger and infected those around me. And I have done that. I've done that in the past. I could have spent the night complaining, and I have done that before in the past. 
I could have created in my mind a, a discrimination against all glass doors. And if you think you don't do this, it's kind of funny because we do. We go, oh my gosh, that food made me throw up. I'm never, ever going to try it again. <laughs> right? Oh, it's funny. I don't like peas, but when the ministers make pea soup, I'm like, I love this soup. So. Do you know why your foot falls asleep in meditation? I love that you say no. <laughs> we think, sometimes we think, right, that it stopped, the blood flow has stopped, right? That's not true. <laughs> That's not true. The, only, the reason why our foot falls asleep in meditation is because we have stop the communication between the brain and the foot. We've cut it off. The blood always flows. There's always signals being sent to all the parts of our body from the brain. It's, it's endless. However, when we pinch the nerve, we, we stop the line of communication. <clears throat> and then communication can't flow freely. And what happens? Foot falls asleep. So when we are faced with sensory conditions, the nine essentials tells us to restore our true nature, our equanimity, our wisdom. Because if we don't step back and pause and observe and accept what arises, we are in a state of resistance to what is. This is not the difference between action or inaction. Vulnerability and surrender to the moment, trust in the moment as it is, is not a weakness. It allows us the ability to wake up and make wise choice in action. So it's wakeful choice versus unconscious, sleeping choice, reactionary choice. <clears throat> so we are boundless, right? Limitless light. We are the origin. We are God. But have we cut off communication? I think it's as simple as that. I think that's what Master Soto San is asking us to look at. This is timeless and placeless practice. He says in the scripture, the purpose of having us recite the essential dharmas in daily practice is not in simply reciting the words. It's, it is to grasp them in our hearts and assess them in our minds, reviewing them to see whether during the day our mind ground has been disturbed, whether we've been deluded, whether, we, whether we've been subject to wrongdoing, have we been self-reliant? Have we been readily learning, readily teaching? We're gonna go over these, so I'm not gonna go through them all. To gather them in your heart, this is a very important statement to me because it's before conceptual understanding, before labeling, and Master Soto San even tells us how to do that. He says, to see with a mind of respect and awe. Einstein said we have two choices, to live as if everything is a miracle or if nothing is a miracle. I have something to show you, I think. You see this? Everybody see that? Yeah? <laughs> Did you catch that? I was going to, Alan's way ahead of me today. Did you catch that? <laughs> I was going to ask you if you caught your mind. Because I would guarantee that most people's minds said rock. Right? <laughs> Is it a rock? 
Trick question. <laughs> yes and no. Yes and no. We call it a rock. But the thing is, when we think we know something, we dismiss it. We never ever see it again. Not really. We gather in our heart or grasp in our heart. We just sit here. We see that all dimensions exist here. Before labels, before judgment. The sacred is here. It's a state of reverence and non-separation. If we were to assess it in our minds, we would see, for lack of better words, that this is a fragment of what sustains our life, that this holds us up as we float around in the sky, just like the rays are part of the sun, just like a drop is part of the ocean, just like we are consciousness itself. This is subject to impermanence like we are, in a constant state of change, just like we are. Yet, we ignore it, step on it, even throw it. But do we see it? Do we ever see ourselves really? So now, look at this one. Look at this one. This is guys. Rock? <laughs> look what he's done. You see this? It's pretty amazing. He's given this a new life. He's given us a great teaching. I think because he could see the sacredness in this. Did you know that this rock is not ignored anymore? This is from the memorial garden outside. I'll put it back, I promise. It's now held in a state of reverence. It's up high. It's not ignored anymore. People comment on them all the time. It's beautiful. Looks like the earth too. See? <laughs> so guy was able to see beyond. Do you think Master Soda Sun's asking you to see the sacred? I don't think so. I think he's asking you to believe that you are the sacred. And once you believe this simple truth, then everywhere is a Buddha image. Every act is a Buddha offering. Reverence is a word until it just is who we are, because we understand we are the sacred. So my son wrote a poem, and I'm going to share it with you, last year. And his poem says, with my eyes I do not see, with my ears I do not hear, with my nose I do not smell, with my mind I do not think, and with my heart I do not seek. This is the song that the six sisters sing to the beginning and to the end. And this is the song that the six sisters sing throughout all time and the land. Gone, gone, gone beyond. It is our this moment to wake up, this moment to surrender to, waking up from the dream of delusion, of separateness. St. Paul in Corinthians 13, he says this a little bit differently, but still, he says it. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. 
If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. He says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When completeness comes, one suchness in action and rest, wholeness of both spirit and flesh, wholeness. And that is only possible if we stop in the moment that we are in with reverence. So my purpose today was to be here and allow deep listening practice, to allow vulnerability, to share. And what I have heard this whole time, what I have heard this whole week is, you are the light of the world. The world is fraught with discrimination and judgment. But to change that, we need to start here. We need to start now, always now. It might get hard, right? Practice, who thinks practice is easy? I see no hands. <laughs> practice sometimes is not easy. Pausing in the middle of an argument seems impossible. Not reacting when you're upset sometimes seems impossible. We all have that experience. But I wish someone would have told me, you know, I wish we got instructions, right? We do have instructions now. Master Soda Sun provides them. But I wish someone would have said early in my life, they would have leaned in. And they would have said, there's never going to be anything more worth it than this, this practice. There's never going to be any gift that you will receive greater than this. What could be greater than knowing yourself? Nothing. You are the light of the world. We're done. <laughs> I ran out of time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy, for your joyful spirit.